Hi, and welcome to the She Geeks Out podcast, where we geek out about workplace inclusion and talk with brilliant humans doing great work, making the world a better and brighter place. I am Rachel Murray, one of your co-hosts. And I'm Felicia Jadzak, the other co-host for today. And Yay! <laughs> so Felicia, yes. we have quite the show ahead of us, mm-hmm. um, quite the episode, and quite... Um, and one of the, we don't want to give a lot away, but we do want to, cause we just can't help ourselves talk a little bit about celebrity crushes. Just real quick. Go. Who's your current. I literally have a list. So <laughs> amazing. Uh, I mean, there's so many, I can't, I can't get into it. And listeners don't understand why we when you listen to the rest of this episode, but I will say, and I've said this before, so it's not going to be like a shocker to anyone, but I do really love Stanley Tucci. Um, the Tooch. The Tooch. The Tooch. Um, <laughs> he was hot when he was young. He's hot now. He's hot in all the roles he's in. He is a bald man. I'm married to someone who I think looks like him a little bit. Um, he does not agree. And I don't know if he really likes that I compare him, but I think it's a great comparison. And I'm loving in like a, a weird way, Stanley Tucci's like little videos that he's been posting since basically early days of the quarantine where he like makes these elaborate cocktails in his home. And he's always got this like, I don't know, he's got like a it's got like a vibe to him. And so, you know, the video is like, he's like making a drink and he's like, Felicity, is the camera rolling? Welcome. I'm going to make you a Negroni. We're in <laughs> Italy. This is the blah, 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 blah. It's just like, it's so, just everything about it is great. I'm really into it. So I have a question. I have a follow up question for you. Um, I love the Tooch. She's a delight. Do you know, do you know who Mark Strong is? The name sounds very familiar, but I cannot say that I know off the top of my head. Did you ever see The Kingsman? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I feel like Mark Strong is Stanley Tucci's Scottish doppelganger. Okay, I'm going to have to do some research on this. Please. Never fear. You know I love a good research project, so I will report back. <laughs> Great. I'm here for it. You. Is is Mark Strong it for you? Or, I mean, I, I we've talked about this before, but I'm curious, like, present day, Rachel, like, where are you well, at? You know, I'm just a fan of the Scottish accent, which is why... <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I mean, I just can't help it. I love the accent. I just, I'm obsessed with it. I don't know what, it's like this very old movie that if, if anyone who's listening uh, has not seen it, that'd be um, understandable. Anyone who has, amazing. It's called A Fish Called Wanda. And the, you know, there's a lot of people who haven't seen it because it was. It is a classic at this point. Yeah. It mm-hmm. is. It is. It's it's not I mean it's in color. It's not in black and white, so it's not that dramatic. But but she's like obsessed when um her her love interest, John Cle played by John Cleese, does these accents and he does like the Russian accent. For me, it's the Scottish accent. So uh my current I guess I haven't really thought about it too much lately, but I would say I'll put James McAvoy is still like high on the list you're, like you're very consistent i like it thanks i'm, yeah. a, I'm like i'm like a penguin in what I'm, way i'm very loyal it's oh. one sorry i have this image of you like <laughs> like waddling, <laughs> waddling. i waddle toward my celebrity crushes <laughs> so i roll <laughs> no i'm just very loyal that's the thing with penguins they stay together forever i like so. it so that's it. So I, I, I've learned, I have a lot of love to give to celebrity crushes. So we'll have to talk more about that after. I know. This, I feel like I have homework to do. Like I need to get better on my crushes. I have other ones. John shows up there. I have mm-hmm. other ones. Yeah. Um, well, let's get into it. Cause we, we could talk a lot more about this, but we have some great conversation coming up. So uh, you'll learn why we're even talking about this when you get into the episode, but we were lucky to chat with Ama, who is a creator, writer, comedian, user experience geek. And we didn't even get to that part of who she is actually, but she is, trust us. Uh, we talked about her experiences giving a TED talk, what it's like to be a stand-up comic, and what she has done personally to support the BIPOC comic community in Boston. So we... <laughs> Cannot spoil any more of what we get up to in this episode. We've already spoiled enough. So please, without further ado, let's geek out with Ama Marfo. Enjoy. 
Welcome, Alma. It's so lovely to have you here. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Felicia. I'm so excited to get into it. Awesome. We are as well. So we're just going to dive right on it because we've got a lot to talk about. So let's just start off with what is your origin story? Who are you? How did you get to where you are right now? How did you get started? Tell us everything. Sure. So my educational background is in communications and education. Um, so after undergraduate, I did professional event planning for a couple years and kind of backed into higher education. So I had a role that was event planning and then student organization advising and space supervision on a community college campus. Uh, liked that. I went to grad school for higher education administration, did that for a little while, and then just started feeling a little bit stuck. Uh, I'm the type of person that up to that point had kind of gone into the roles that she was hired for and tried to figure out how they could work better. Uh, and then once I kind of hit that ceiling of they're not going to let me touch anything else or I've done everything that I can do, then it's time to go. And yeah, I just kind of hit that ceiling and was like, let's do something a little bit different. Um, although I will say that as I was doing that, I kind of looked to tech a lot for inspiration. They were doing a lot with creativity and innovation that higher education just wasn't. Um, so I was able to kind of find a foothold in that space as I was doing some of that higher education work. And then when I left, um, started doing a bit more in that space. So now I identify as content designer, UX writer, content strategist, um, just kind of taking the writing skills that I've been developing, frankly, since I was a kid and applying them to the tech space. So it took me a little bit to get here, but I'm in it and for the most part, really enjoying it. <laughs> Which is uh, remarkable. Sorry, go on. No, no, don't be sorry. This is the the downside of not being in person. But I was going to say, there's definitely like this pipeline from higher ed to tech. I think is very distinct. So you're part of that that pipeline. Mm -hmm. today. Um, mm -hmm. I just had a really quick question. You mentioned you started your writing really early. So like, tell us more about that. What's that about? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was always a kid that wrote stories. Uh, my mom, I was just visiting my parents over the summer and she found books that I had written when I was like five, seven, 12, just like fiction stories. Um, the about the authors were always very elaborate, which is bonkers now to think about a five-year-old with so much to say for her about the author section. Um, but yeah, had done journalistic writing, had done academic writing, had done blogging, um, had done content for a number of different types of blogs and yeah, it's just kind of always something I've really enjoyed and developing voices for things, both mine and then being able to kind of slide into that of an organization. And you, so we're, we're going to probably talk more about the work side of things, but I think one of the things that is just so exciting about you is also the non-work, the sure. cool, fun stuff that you get to do. So mm -hmm. I got to watch your lessons and laughter Ted talk, which was so cool to watch. Thank you. Um, and so now you're like in comedy and why don't mm -hmm. you just talk a little bit about that first? I just wanted to just first question is like the Ted talk experience is like an experience, right? Yeah. From, as a speaker, can you just talk a little bit about what that was like? Yeah. So I was actually asked to do that before I was a comedian. I did it the same year, I believe it was 2016, but I hadn't started comedy yet, but I had a lot of feelings about how it could impact the way that we work in the environment, the way we build relationships with people, the way we get through difficult times. Um, I've been doing some writing about comedy, but not really performing it. Uh, so I was asked to do it by a friend who was running that particular TEDx event. Um, the And I have had been speaking full time for a little bit, continue to, and it is the hardest talk I've ever prepared for. It's also the one I remember the least. Like I went up, I did it, I left, and my sister was there and I was like, how'd it go? I don't remember. Like it just, I went up and I, and I've watched it since, but like the actual experience of doing it is gone. Like that's how like high level, high pressure it was that like I left my body to be able to effectively complete it. Can we, can we like tell me what the actual process is for that? So for me, it was a little bit different than some of the other talks I do because you have more time, right? In an hour, you can play around a little bit, kind of adapt as the audience gives you what they need, answer questions, those sorts of things. But Ted, I believe the timeline is like nine to 17 minutes. You cannot go over. Like you're not allowed. I've only ever seen one person go over. Um, Governor Michael Dukakis did one, but like, you're going to let him talk if he wants. Like 
he's earned that i have not <laughs> um so being able to time it so precisely i had like a spreadsheet so like here's the thing that i want to say for this slide here's how long it has to take me and like when i have to be in and out so it's so uh choreographed almost yeah. just the amount of time that you have and to make sure that you don't go above that limit um it's it's really challenging one of the hardest things i've ever done i'm grateful to have done it um but yeah it's very difficult it sounds awful i don't <laughs> think i would ever do it I have a quick a quick question before you continue on because i know there's another part to your your question uh rachel but so recently, Ama, you were actually a speaker at one of our SGO live events in person. I think the first one actually that we've held in person since the pandemic. And yeah. and one thing that I didn't really prep the speakers beforehand because it's been a while and we were rusty is we do 10 minute timers, mm -hmm. a 10 minute deadline. Did that feel like, did you have like a flashback to the TED talk where you're like, oh my God, or were you like, this is great. I'm fine with this. Because some speakers have definitely reacted differently with that little beep when the 10 minutes goes off. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a bit of each because I hadn't done anything speakery to that length in a while, mm -hmm. but I have done comedy to that length in a, uh, very regularly. So I think kind of the difference between that point where I did that talk and I think it was February 2016 to where I am now is I know how 10 minutes feels a little bit better and I'm able to kind of like adapt and move things around a little bit. Um, Ted just doesn't really allow for that. But with this, it was a little bit more play, especially because the topic was a little bit more playful and I had a little bit more um, license to interact with the audience that was there. Mm -hmm. um, it got easier. So there's about, and there's like seven or eight years between those two things too. So wow. in a lot of ways, I've gotten better at playing around in that like very clearly defined time. I have an off script question sure. that is it's related. Just how did you like get into comedy? Like, it seems like, how did you like make that mental shift from like, I think I'm a pretty funny person and I make my friends laugh to like, I think I need a microphone and actually like t to have people judge me that I don't, that don't even know me and my comedy. Great question. It varies from person to person. I will say uh, when those same friends that tell you you're funny in conversation dare you to take a comedy class, you do it. <laughs> That's what happened. Um, so again, the TED talk was in February. In January, a group of three friends who at the time I was doing a podcast with, they had gotten together unbeknownst to me and like in the recording for like our goals for that year, they're like, you're doing comedy this year. Uh, so I took a class that summer with a friend of mine, um, got on stage and had that recital like August 1st of that year. Um, and then ended up really liking it. And I was like, for as long as it's fun, I'll do it. And been able to find a way to make it fun since. Amazing. And Felicia, feel free to ask these sub questions, by the way. Otherwise, I'm just going to be asking all the questions. No, no, no. It's yeah. all good. Jump on in. <laughs> um, okay. So, you know, we talked about comedy. Uh, I want to talk more about some other stuff that you're involved with. But before mm -hmm. we get into sort of the next train of discussion, I just want to kind of wrap up this little piece of it by just asking, you know, kind of what your thoughts are on like comedy writ large. And also, I guess, for you personally, the role of comedy right now, because, you know, it's 2023. It's been a lot the last couple of years. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, there's always like a balance between laughter and sorrow, not to get too high level in this, but, sure. you, know, you know, sort of how you're thinking about um, why it's so important, or is it important at this point um, in your in your experience? This is a big question, and I was having a part of this conversation with a friend earlier today. Um, I will say that comedy has a really effective way of finding light ways to make points. Mm -hmm. So in a way that you might not necessarily feel compelled to listen to somebody if they were so passionate that it might come forth into anger or judgment or things like that, there's kind of pieces of comedy that can make those conversations easier to have. Um, so I do think it's tremendously powerful for that. Um, I did a show a couple months ago and I was talking to some people that had just seen the show online and come on a whim and someone had referred to me as a political comedian, which was very surprising mm -hmm. to me because I don't know that I would have identified myself as such, but going through my material and the things that I did that night, I was like, I definitely have a perspective and I have things that I want to say and there are political elements to it, but I do think that it's very different from like something you would see from like a daily show correspondent or someone who would more openly admit to being like openly political about things. Mm -hmm. I think there are degrees on that. Um, the other thing I would say is that 
we've gotten into this space where comedians are kind of being billed as truth tellers. And we've been mm-hmm. lucky that we've had comedians like Jon Stewart, like Trevor Noah, um, like Roy Wood Jr., other people who have taken the moment to talk about political issues through comedy, but not everyone's going to want to do that. And I think that that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the conversation that I was having was specifically um, related to Hassan Minaj and the mm-hmm. fire he was under recently for essentially a New Yorker reporter fact checked his jokes. And I don't think anybody should ever be subject to that. He chose to stretch the truth on things that I would have made different decisions, but that doesn't mean that every single thing that you tell in a joke has to be factually accurate. Mm-hmm. He also didn't use pseudonyms. I would not have done that. I would have used different names. And I think part of the trouble that he got in <laughs> was that people that were mentioned were then identified and like, some of them were asked questions, okay. Some of them were asked, not okay. So mm-hmm. how can you find that blend of things that are true or feel true, but also give people the license to stretch because that's where comedy does come from, being able to yeah. heighten things so you can make a point without something having to like strictly adhere to a timeline or what you feel the truth is. So mm-hmm. it's a complicated dance, but I do think it is a net positive. It provides a net benefit in times that are really difficult. Yeah. yeah. I recently heard someone say that um, comedians are the last philosophers. That's a lot to live up to. I just want to be silly. Like, <laughs> it's it be Aristotle out here. <laughs> it is. And it's, and some people I think really thrive under that mantle and are doing fantastic things with it. Like, again, Roy Wood Jr. is absolutely fantastic at it. Um, who else did I want to say? Uh, Jay Jordan, uh, who did the problem with Jon Stewart. Like, there are a lot of people in that vein that are fantastic at it, but some of us just want to joke through things that are difficult, and that's okay too. Like, I think they have the capacity to be, but to paint the role of comedian as that is challenging. It's yeah. a lot to live up to. Not it's everybody wants to. Yeah, just be you funny know? and be silly. It's it's totally, and that's and I like that you straddle. You can sort of be in both. You can be wherever you want to be. Yeah, it's it's a continuum. I think you can touch yes. those things. You could choose not to touch those things. You could pick the ones that really matter to you and kind of dig in there. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of Elijah Schlesinger, and I like. Yeah. I think that she does a great job of straddling being absolutely ridiculous and silly with her goat noises uh, to mm-hmm. like just calling folks in. Yeah, really out. And, let's be real. As she's on a stage yeah, with a yeah, it's a bit of both, <laughs> and and there are so many different ways to do it. Like I remember um, listening to an interview with a comedian, Emily Heller, who's written for Barry and a couple other shows, mm. and um, had done some jokes that kind of got held up as kind of like indicative or evocative of what feminism looks like, and she's like. Mm. Lots of people are doing that. Like Tim Robinson from I Think You Should Leave, like it's wildly ridiculous stuff, but it also says something so specific about masculinity. She's like, if you don't think he has a point of view on what like manhood is spread like, like watch it again. And I've never forgotten that. So it can come across however it needs to and work in so many different ways. Totally. I love it. I I wanted to give Felicia a space if you had a follow up question. If not, I'm just going to like get into it. I, I feel like yes and no. The, the reason I'm like, ah, is because I just want to talk about some of this like for days and days and days. But I also know we have so much other stuff to talk about with you. Um, I guess maybe just really briefly, I'll just mm-hmm. mention, I love that you brought up Hassan Minhaj because I went down a whole rabbit hole recently with like the New Yorker article and then his mm-hmm. 20 minute plus response to it. Mm-hmm. And it was really fascinating. And again, like I don't that'll have to be a conversation for another time. But I was just thinking about, you know, what you were saying around the role of the comedian. And I do feel like there is an element of like, just like DEI work and DEI practitioners, like speaking truth to power. And I think that Mm -hmm. it's a vehicle to do that. And obviously not everyone embodies this role or wants to or chooses to and sometimes it happens anyway but I think that's definitely an element of it because there's some things you can say using comedy that you can't say if you were just going to say it flat out and the point around like what is the truth I think that's subjective so Mm -hmm. you know I'll say on that point otherwise this podcast will go off the rails and we'll just talk about all that forever (laughs) sure but no I I want to affirm that because I do think that a great piece of that is like when you say speaking truth to power like to whom is the truth true 
mm-hmm. right? And like, how true does that truth have to be? Mm-hmm. Like, what he is used in his sets. And I remember seeing him like the first time I like really laughed after the 2016 election was at a Hassan Minaj show. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I had just been despondent for the last several that cried on a plane, which I don't recommend. It's absolutely terrible. <laughs> um, but like this, the following Sunday. I had had tickets to see him for ages and was excited. I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. And it was the first time that I had laughed in almost a week. Um, But yeah, but getting at all those things that he says in those sets, like they are, like he says, emotionally true and speak to real experiences that people had. Should it take away from that because it didn't happen exactly as it said it? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that the phenomena that he's speaking about do happen are true should be listened to by people in power and the idea that it's not exactly as it happened taking away from that is is difficult to think about well and you know like we talk a lot at sgo about like the idea of multiple truths and i mean yes. I think the other thing too is layering into that concept is the idea of storytelling which is i think what he is talking about a lot in yeah. his rebuttal and, and what he does because you know like one of the stories that the new yorker like called him out on as not happening was the story of his prom date. And he's like, it right. happened. It just didn't happen on the night of the prom. It happened exactly before, but like, it still happened. And I mean, he came with receipts and like, I was mm-hmm. like, all right, like go you with your receipts. But you know, it, that's the point, right? It's like, okay, so does it make it less true because you change something to make it a more like emotional, evocative, poignant, whatever it is, story. And I know for me as like a facilitator, I use storytelling a lot because sometimes I'm talking to people who don't have any way of connecting to the experience yeah. and they don't have an experience. So I use myself and yeah, like I definitely will take like the kernel, the nugget of truth and then like, you know, frame it sometimes in a way that I know will get to my audience better, but it doesn't mean I'm lying. It just means that like, maybe I like, you know, I use a different name or I, I, you know, talk about how it happened a little bit differently or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But if that that's a concept that really was sticking with me because I think, especially after the 2016 elections, the idea of what is the truth has been so right. top of mind for all of us. And, you know, and I think again, with that concept of multiple truths, like my truth versus you, your truth. And like, even right now it's happening um, in the world. And like the idea of all this misinformation that's out there and like, what is true and what is not. And I think it's just a relevant topic that's kind of going on right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And again, I would have changed names. Like I have a joke that I do right now that has like my friend's kids involved. I don't use those kids' real names. They're four and five years old. There's no reason for me to. Um, And like, are the stories that they told me true? Yes. If you were to try to fact check them, would they come up as true? No, because I don't need four-year-olds harassed for what I'm saying. They don't need it. Their parents don't need it. I would never wish that on anybody. So I'll say I have different grievances with his process than what has been presented. It's like, you should be mad about this. I'm like, I'm not. I actually have different issues with that. <laughs> now I'm like, I want to hear what the issues are. <laughs> just just mo- honestly, mostly just like use different names. It's not hard. Just use different names. You've already said it three times. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, you're no, right. It's fine. You said it. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if there was anything else. That's great. Um, thank you for going down that rabbit hole. I'm here Happy for to- it. I didn't actually read it, but now I want to read about it. I do. I'm a fan of his, so I'm curious about all of that. So, um, I want to hear about Fodball Productions. Let's what talk about they? Fodball Productions. Yeah, tell tell our listeners what is it, how you started it, all of it. So when I started doing comedy, I found myself in the position where you get told a lot to go to open mics, test out your material, go as often as you can, go every single day if possible, which and it's just based on who I am as a person didn't feel particularly sustainable, but there was a time that I did try to follow that advice. And what I found was that I was in rooms with a lot of guys who had pretty similar perspectives. Um, I say guys very intentionally, that's who it (laughs) was. Um, And then kind of going into those spaces and realizing that either I wasn't getting listened to because someone would just look at me immediately and be like, well, I don't have anything to relate to. So like, I can tune this out. I could go Mm -hmm. take a smoke break. I could do something else. Or, they would be listening, but there would be like this physical presence of like, impress me. Mm. Um, all right, you're going to come up here and think you're funny. Like, what do you have to say? Am I going to relate to it? All of those things. And it's not a comfortable position to be in, um, especially when you add to the fact that occasionally you'll be going up right after somebody who has a joke 
not particularly informed, not particularly interesting or unique about black people, about black mm. women, about women in general. So there's kind of this added stuff that you carry on stage with you. And I started going less and less as a result of it, started trying to find other ways to connect with people and practice and get good. And the more people that I talk to, especially during the pandemic, when we kind of had options to more be more picky and choosy about where we were practicing, mm -hmm. the more I found that there were other women, people of color, people across the LGBTQ plus spectrum that didn't like participating in that space because it didn't feel good. They didn't feel like they were getting any better and they didn't enjoy the company that they were taking part in. Um, and then separately from that, I had done a festival in New York in 2019 and met two other black women from Boston who I'd never met before because we were never on shows together because mm. the vast majority of shows would have either me or one of them. We never got to work together mm. and to have to like travel to meet people that are like in your backyard. One of them lives three minutes up the street from me and we never would have met if we hadn't gone to a show and this was the black women in comedy festival so we all got to be together um so kind of going through those experiences meeting other people who are feeling the same way i said can we do this differently is there a way that we could put together shows that all of the people that normally are like one per get to work together get to see each other's comedy get to encourage each other to be better um get to work with one another with people who are committed to them improving um, and that's kind of where it was born. I met a couple people through workshops, uh, other people that I had known, actually a former student from when I was in higher education, and now we both do comedy. She was involved at the outset. Um, but yeah, just working with people to create shows and spaces where those of us that are normally kind of pushed to the side, um, from Shonda Rhimes' year of Yes, Fodball comes from first only or different. So the people that are first only or different on their lineups um, and built a set of shows, a comedy collective that aims to do that. Can we, like, is there, is there a website? Can we plug it? Yes. Um, I, it's, a, there's a bit.ly cause the, the, um, URL is a bit complicated, but we are on Instagram and Facebook at Fodball Productions. That tends to be easier. Amazing. Um, but yeah, all of our upcoming shows are on there and yeah, we just work with such talented people who normally you would see for like seven minutes on a show and then mentally kind of get crowded out by a bunch of other folks who are doing things that are fairly similar, but not always as good or as unique or as relatable to a larger swath of comedy fans. Amazing. Can I ask what the reception has been to Fodball? Because I can only imagine given, you know, what you described in which I feel like both Rachel and I are like, yes, we recognize that kind of mm -hmm. space and that, you know, that feeling of like tokenization and, you know, being on the outskirts. And I can only imagine what, a reaction in the spaces that you were used to being in could have been. So I'm curious mm -hmm. what sort of reception you've seen or experienced so far. It's a good question. And I would say, I think we've been very lucky. Um, we've gotten support from a lot of people who maybe at first glance, we wouldn't have expected to be supportive of it. Um, and yeah, it's been really nice. I would say my favorite piece of it, in addition to kind of like working with people who normally I wouldn't have gotten to work with, has been from people who didn't realize they were comedy fans or people who knew that they were comedy fans, but they didn't like how it felt to go to some of the shows in the area. Um, people that have mentioned like, oh, turns out when I'm not the butt of the joke or not worried about like being made fun of as a person in the audience and hearing a joke about me that maybe doesn't feel good or go over well, when I'm not worried about that, I actually really like comedy. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been grateful for the people who maybe thought that it wasn't an art form for them that mm -hmm. we've been able to bring back into the fold. Um, yeah. And then to kind of like find allyship from those who maybe don't identify as um, folks who would be on our shows, but talk them up, love the comedians that we work with, um, are willing to promote and work with us. Um, mm. That's been really, really nice. I think it could have been bad. And I feel like a part of me is always like bracing for someone to like yell at us about it and be like, Ugh! but so far touch wood it hasn't happened and i'm really really grateful for that yeah oh, that's wonderful to hear because i feel like yeah that's always the you know the sort of like hidden elephant on the other side where you're like oh yeah, that just gonna... like wait just like just a wincing of like waiting for someone to be and like every now and again it'll happen like we've um like posted about shows and then someone in the comments will be like i think you forgot to put men on the lineup and it's like no no we remember <laughs> um yeah i remember there was a show that i did it actually wasn't a fodball show but it was a show um 
for an online group that I work with called Knock KO Comedy, Knockout Comedy, and it was all women. And a guy in the uh, in the comments was like, "Oh, you left sausage out of the recipe," and I was like, "No, I know how to cook. It's gonna be great." And <laughs> of course, this person didn't come to the show, so then it's just a lineup of six women of varying different backgrounds a couple people from like one from canada one from uh sri lanka so it was like an international show and it was just busting on this guy that's like imagine not thinking this was going to be a good show just because there were no men on it (laughs) and of course not all of our shows like go into that like explicit bashing but that was just such a good opportunity and everybody worked with it so well (laughs) couldn't have loved it more it's a good time Mine too. I love it. <laughs> yeah. To be clear, that is not what every football show is. It isn't. I have to. I have to make that very clear. Most of them are just we tell our jokes and we go about our way. But if you give us an opportunity, we're gonna take it. As you should. Mm-hmm. This is the business. Yes, we're giving you the business. We've been taking it for decades. That's right. <laughs> I love you. it. Um, oh. let's switch gears a little bit because. We talk a lot about comedy. You're not just a comedian. So you're also a speaker, writer, consultant. So could you share a little bit of your experience as working as a freelancer and why you're thinking about maybe going back into the workplace right now? Yeah, so I've done a bit of each. I, from 2016 to, I mean, 2020 changed everything for everybody, but I had been working on my own um, as a speaker and facilitator. And I liked it. Like, again, kind of going back to things that were new to some folks that maybe weren't new to me, like working from home, I'd been doing it. I really enjoyed it. I continue to enjoy it. Um, And then as far as like working for myself, I liked a lot of being able to drive what I was interested in and build things that aligned with what I was excited about, what I wanted to research, what I wanted to share with folks. And then I think in 2020, there was a lot of opportunity to reassess things. So I had been at that point traveling probably once every 10 days for about five years. Mm. And then six months of work disappeared in a day and a half and I couldn't go anywhere. Mm. And that'll give you some opportunities to rethink some things. (laughs) So I think I was in need of a sense of stability that I hadn't had in a while. Um, And also just like, especially because I wasn't going anywhere, like really missed people. And I identify as an introvert. So people think like, oh, did you? And I'm like, yeah, no, I really did. I I missed working with people. And so much of being a freelancer, the way that I was doing it was pretty solitary. Mm -hmm. Um, So the opportunity to go back to full-time work was helpful in a couple ways. Um, It was helpful to just kind of have something that I was supposed to be doing every day and give me a sense of routine where a lot of us felt unmoored. Uh, Because again, like work disappeared. I didn't have to be anywhere. There was so much I didn't have to do, but also working with people towards a common goal. Like, I don't think I had realized how much I missed that until um, that opportunity had presented itself. So I still do a bit of each. I think I probably, no matter what I'm doing, will do a bit of each, but having some things that I work on in collaboration with others combined with kind of my own individual pursuits is how I like to work. I love that you like know yourself too. You know, I think people really struggle with, okay, I should just work for the man or screw the man. I'm going to do this. And you really seem to have developed uh, a way of working that really suits you as well as, you know, involving, I think it sounds like your, your creativity within your workplace. And so that's sort of the next question that I had is you've written about creativity and it's use in the workplace. And I was wondering Mm -hmm. if you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I, I've spent a lot of time really just like getting to know myself and figuring out what I needed. And what I recognize that I liked a lot is the capacity to create change within an organization. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that creativity is a way to convey how that might need to be done. um, And to make a case for new ways of getting things done that a lot of other strategies just hadn't. Um, So I found a lot of value in it and recognizing that some of the spaces that I had been interacting with previously just didn't have a great sense of how powerful creativity was or what it could be used for. um, It got me thinking about how can I convey this? How can I talk about this? How can I infuse this into spaces that need it, but might not seek it out on their own? Um, So yeah, I spent a lot of time doing that. I continue to, I do think that having In spaces that are typically regimented for any number of reasons, um, being able to kind of walk people through, yes, creativity is valuable. Yes, even if you don't think you're creative, you have the capacity to be, and here's how you can use that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
it's freed people, I think, from some of the things that they feel like they should be doing or have to do. And some of them you do have to do, but some of them you don't. Some of it is just, I've never thought of another way to do it. And right. that, that's not a good reason to keep doing something. What else can we do? So being able to kind of walk people through that process and kind of open their, their mind to the possibilities that are available is something I really like. Well, now I want to hear an example. Do you have like a shining example of something? Mm. Do I have a shining example? Right, this, was, this is an off script question. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's fair. I like these. Um, so when I was working at Emanuel College, when I got there, one of the things that was under the purview of my position was a ticketed events program. So we would buy blocks of tickets to Red Sox games, movies, Boss Ballet, things like that. And the goal was to open up those possibilities to students that might not be able to afford them at full price, um, even if there was like a student discount, if they were to just walk up to the uh, to the box office. And the process at the time when I got there was like, I would have a block of tickets in my office and let's say they would go on sale Wednesday at noon. People would have to come to my office, be in line like within the first 30 to 50 people, depending on what the event was and have the money with them. And in addition to just being inefficient, and in addition to just being like physically uncomfortable, like especially on like Red Sox Yankees tickets days, like I would try to leave my office to do something else at like 945 in the morning and like 10 people would be like, is it time yet? And I'm like, it is it. I just hang on. So like I kind of would feel like trapped in my office on those days or like walk out of my office to do something. It's like it's not for tickets. I just have to make copies like physically uncomfortable. So there were pieces of that, but also like from like an equity perspective, I was thinking like, who has the opportunity to come here and sit from 930 in the morning until yeah. noon? students who don't feel as though it's okay to burn like two and a half hours, possibly skipping classes, students that are on campus, which means anyone that lives off campus or is working that day doesn't have the capacity to do it. It didn't feel like an equitable way for that process to go through. So we started thinking about how can we build this out in a way that more people have access? And we thought about it a lot of different ways. Like, do we move it from my office to the union where more people are likely to be passing through? Um, do we switch up the days where it happens? So it's not the same time every single day or every single time that we do it. Um, should we have an online option? Should that online option accept payment? How do we like set up a wait list if tickets become available? So what we ended up doing was a combination of all of those things where you reserve the ticket on Eventbrite and then came to the office to pay for it. Right. And then after a certain point, if you didn't claim that reservation, Eventbrite automatically generated a wait list so then we can go to people later. If you weren't on campus, but you had five minutes to reserve it online at home, you could do that. Um, it gave us a little bit more flexibility, again, not just in like someone having to like be there at that time to do it, but also those who maybe didn't have the access or the capacity to be able to be there on that day did still have access to those things. So I was really pleased with kind of the flexibility that it gave us to widen the scope of who got to participate in these events. Love. It speaks to my Virgo heart. I'm Virgo too. So <laughs> ah, I was that getting that from was. you. I was getting that from you. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> and we did it all with Foolish is, Foolish is secretly a Virgo. Somehow she was born in February, but I think you're secretly a Virgo somehow. Mm -hmm. right. thing or something. It, it must be in there somewhere. Yeah. You know, I, I, I still have to like, we, we did uh, an activity early in the pandemic where we did like star charts and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, a thing that happened and uh, I need to find mine <laughs> because I need to figure out like, am I a Virgo rising or like what's happening there? But yes, I've got a lot of uh, Virgo sensibilities in this little Aquarius being. It might be in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually had a quick follow-up question on this whole topic, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, because creativity is something I've been thinking a lot about over the last couple of years. And do you think that creativity like can be taught? Because I definitely, mm -hmm. I feel that you can lose creativity or like you lose your creative juices. So curious, like what your thoughts are on that process. Mm -hmm. I do. I do think that it can be taught. I think it, the way that I convey it to people is that there are kind of a set of capacities that most folks have or can develop. So some of that is access to individuals. So being able to find people that you can collaborate with that think a little bit differently from you. Some of that is having like mentors or people in higher levels of influence that give you permission to do things off the beaten path. Um, but there are also things like being willing to look a lot of different places for information. So as an example, like when I was first starting to work with students on how they could expand how they went about things, 
there's some educational theory that covers that, but some of that was in business books. Some of that was at tech events. So I was going to tech events to kind of learn things and being willing to be the type of person that's like, I read this article. I want to try that thing. I heard this on a podcast. Can I learn more? Um, that's a creative capacity. Um, staying determined, just being the kind of person that will stick with a tough problem, um, that can be valuable for creativity. Mm -hmm. So I think even if a lot of people would at first glance say, no, I'm not creative when asked, asking them like, all right, well, what about these pieces? Like, are you willing to ask a question where maybe no one else is willing to ask a question or be the person in a meeting to say like, what if we did this or why can't we do this? That's a creative capacity. And if you pull all of those things together, odds are you'd actually be pretty good at creative enterprises if you chose to put those capacities to work in a certain way. Uh, so yeah, I do think it can be taught. And I do think most people have some combination of those traits, skills, um, abilities to be able to make it happen. Yay. I, I agree. And I also feel like it's definitely, it takes time because I'm somebody who feels like they lost all their creativity. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're a business owner. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I spent all my brain energy on like business stuff and, you know, solving the world's problems and DEI related issues. And so I've been actively working on um, just taking art classes, well, pottery classes really the last mm -hmm. year or so. And let me tell you, it is like humbling because I would have yes. described myself as a very creative person before and I was like super into art and like all the stuff when I was younger and like in the college and after and now I'm like what color do I paint this misshapen thing that came from my hand and I look over at like the person who literally just started and they're like creating this amazingly beautiful thing that has like all this intricate stuff and I'm like did you uh think of that or did you were you like me and like come up with this on Pinterest because <laughs> no creativity Jesus left so but I, what I've learned is that it's like it's a work in progress because you have to do it in order to like get it going and it it's um yeah it's it's been a whole process that I've been really thinking a lot about well and it's interesting to me because when I talk to people about well when I first asked the question like do you identify as creative and someone says no it's extremely common for them to explain something art related that they're yeah. not good at and that's fascinating to me that this conflation of creative creativity and artistry has kind of pulled people out. They're like, I can't draw a circle. I, all the people I draw are stick figures. And that has been the bucket that we've put creativity in. And I push it further than that. I'm like, did you feed yourself this week without grocery shopping? There's creativity in that. Did you get yourself dressed in a way that like feels cohesive, even though nothing's clean? That counts. Um, all of those things can can count like even we're in november right now as we record this and i am getting ready for i think it's like the fourth or fourth annual uh cranstagram so pumpkin gets a lot of hype in october and like it's fine but i love cranberries and i don't feel like they are sufficiently appreciated so i do like a bunch of cranberry recipes in november wow. um and like cranstagram what cranstagram cranstagram is like the ongoing hashtag that each year has like a specific one and this year's is only crayons <laughs> but i'll like make a bunch of things like with cranberries and i'm like i just did these lemon cranberry muffins um i found mm -hmm. a like granola bar recipe for like cranberries and it's it's not something that most people would think of when you think about creativity but it's just like here's a fruit that floats and nobody thinks about 11 months out of the year and I am celebrating them. And like, that is a creative endeavor. And like in some years, like honestly, 2020, I was like, I think that's the only thing I did well this year. It was like make very thing, but it's so fun and so silly. And then as I've come to do it, like people in October, are like, are you doing Cranstagram this year? And they're like, they'll send me pictures of things that they found that have cranberry in them. So it's become like this really nice communal experience. And most of the time when you're asking somebody if they're creative, they don't think about things like that. But mm -hmm. of course that counts. Why wouldn't it? Oh, just, thank you. This is very helpful to be reminded of. I appreciate that. And love the cranberry focus because that's my favorite thing during the holidays is cranberries. Yes. 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 Are we and you have so have a... much of the people are like, what do you do with it? And I was like, let me tell you. <laughs> you no, know, that is kind of our like logo color is mm -hmm. kind of cranberry so maybe we need to like have a maybe we need to get in on this cranstagram situation i hope you it. do i, I ho and, 
Yeah. And I, th- I also will say thank you so much, Amma, for saying this because Felicia is so creative. It is wild that she's saying that she isn't like, not only does she co-run a business mm-hmm. that it requires a ton of creativity for many reasons, mm-hmm. but also in her spare time, she and her husband did uh, started F- Porch Fest in their town and ran that and like went to the arts committee and like did all of that. And that's Felicia, just a t- I know. That's a massive creative act. Seriously. What are we even talking about? So what if you can't not, perfectly shape a bowl? not all about me. It's about you, Amma. <laughs> I appreciate it. Because it's important because I, I, yeah, like I feel like I just went on a journey right now that the listeners are <laughs> yours if there's any of you out there watching. Um, maybe went on with me. But yeah, I think it's important though to remind ourselves like there are other aspects of, you know, being creative. And, but I do still go back to what I was saying earlier and why I asked that question, which is I do think you can like lose it and maybe it's not even lose it, but lose the ability to like appreciate those areas where we are creative without yeah. having to fit into like that, that label or that box. So, yeah. And you, and you can have seasons of life where you tap into it less. And even then, I don't think you lose it. I think it's still there. I think it's just a matter of finding a venue for it or like a portal to express it. Cause I know like for me, probably around 2014, um, I was just at a point in work where I was burnt. Like I was doing a lot of the same thing every day. It wasn't to say I wasn't tapping into creativity, but none of it felt particularly interesting. Um, and that's when I started sketch writing. Cause I was like, I need something to do that is totally different that I don't do on a regular basis with people who I don't already know, mm. like just break out in so many different ways. And it was so much fun. And I love the people that I met. I love the end product that we were able to produce and, yeah, like when you kind of sense it waning, figuring out ways to kind of tap back into it can can get you to continue moving. It's like related yet completely unrelated at all. I have like Amazing. A really quick question before we have like a couple more to get through, but have you ever done sketch comedy, like improv? What are your thoughts so, on that? Sure. So there's sketch <laughs> comedy that is for the <laughs> most part like written. No, well, and that's okay. So yeah, so there's sketch comedy, which is for the most part like written and then performed. Okay. There's improv, which is like unscripted and pretty spontaneous. And then there's stand up. I have done all three. I would say on my continue of like things that I enjoy the most, I enjoy stand up um, and do a lot of it. Um, I really like writing sketch, but I don't much care to perform sketch because I don't, I don't identify as an actor. Um, mm. So I have done sketch that I've written and then other people put it up and I love that. Um, improv, I think, is probably the least attractive to me. I recognize that it's immensely valuable. I have so many friends that do it and love it, but I don't have the constitution for the spontaneity of it. It's extremely difficult oh, for me. You and us both. That's why Rachel's shaking her head now because we're all like, <laughs> yeah. But from a from a per- performing perspective, not a, an audience mm-hmm. perspective. Oh no, no. Right. For me, it is actually both. I want to make that very clear. And that, listen, it's, very, it's a very common perspective. I want to say, at minimum, you are not alone in that. I feel a little alone in the circles that I run in. People are like, why wouldn't you want to pay $7 to watch people make up things mm-hmm. spontaneously and 90% of it would be terrible? <laughs> so, and I'll also say this, it's like when it is done well, yes. it's transcendent and i don't use that word lightly like and i've seen some people who are wonderful at it do it live uh jason manzukas who a lot of us know from like brooklyn 99 or the good place i got to see him do it live at ucb and it was one of the most amazing things i've ever seen um john gabris same thing nicole byers this year's made like there are people who are next level amazing at it and i love that but you're right when it's not good it is very very difficult to get through to endure amazing when it's bad it's really terrible <laughs> right. right and i will say i am a huge jason monsuka's fan yeah. i listen to how did this get made it mm-hmm. is my favorite podcast and it is largely because of his brilliance quick uh, podcast recommendation if yeah. you did you listen to thirst aid kit when it was either on slate or buzzfeed no so mm-hmm. thirst aid kit thirst just aid. in general is a podcast about like adult women having crushes which is extremely my jam like that is who i am as a person and they have an episode called jason and jason again that is split between their crushes on jason sudeikis and jason manzukis and it is one of my favorite episodes so please go listen to it it's excellent tonight it's great that is happening yeah i will i will send you a link after this it is so important to me that you listen to this because it's wonderful the whole the premise of the podcast as a whole like i am 
deeply sad that it does not exist in like the Pedro Pascal, Jeremy Allen White era. Cause yeah. I think they would have so much to talk about it. Yeah. It's sadly defunct, but wonderful, wonderful show. It should be brought back by Phoebe Robinson because her Ooh. Instagram is Thir like, Oh yes. The thirsty Thursdays. Yeah. Right. I get sent the, I mean, today's Thursday. I have to see who she put up, yeah. um, but I regularly get sent those. It's like, have you seen this? I'm like, yes, I have. <laughs> and so, um, let me, let me also say this just, publicly because i have a venue and a microphone yes. sending people memes or videos that they have already seen never apologize for it sending somebody something that they would enjoy is an act of love and i appreciate it every Aww. single time i get it even though i got like for an example the pedro pascal's easter eggs like slides i got those probably like 12 to 20 times on easter and i enjoyed it every single time so do not ever apologize for sending something somebody sending something to somebody that you know they would love that is how we show love to each other please keep doing it yeah even if you think they've seen it it's I'm a love language you know like what your crushes are so we can start sending you stuff because i'll tell you yes the sgo i don't even know if this is true but for me and rachel at least team mm -hmm. SGO, keanu reeves massive great one corporate crush on Keanu Reeves. Yep. Personally, for many, many, many years, one of my very good friends, Uni, and I had what we called JGL Fridays, which was an appreciation of Joseph Gordon-Levitt on a Great. Friday. And so Great. every single Friday, we would send, and we took turns, so we would send each other a picture, a video, whatever, of JGL. And right now, I will say, because my husband reminds me of him, I'm like, Real big into Stanley Tucci because also his like videos are ridiculous where he's cooking and he always starts. So cr I just read his memoir earlier this year. So crush worthy. <laughs> You've got a great list. I'll actually show. We are in a video medium at the moment, so I will show you two that are represented on my water bottle right now. There are more, but there are two here. So Live video, right? This one says, "I hope Oscar Isaac is having a good day." <laughs> Um, and they make it in a couple different ones. So, like, I got my friend that I hope Brendan Fraser is having a good day uh, um, and gave it to her. There's a Taika TT. There's obviously a Pedro Pascal. <laughs> um, and then the other one is someone made a Pedro Pascal oh the Eras Tour sticker. Um, so, and I'm not, like, a, a stickers on things person. I have a huge envelope of them in my desk because I have a lot of anxiety about sticking them to things. And, like, literally last week I was like, be a grown-up. Just stand for something on your water bottle actually i have a she geeks out one and it's gonna go like here -ish. Oh, yeah, i just remember yeah. um but yeah i was like just no stand for something put it on there so these are like newly adhered to this but mm -hmm. those are the two right now um and then actually a friend made buttons for me and i have this one next to my desk uh it is steven stamkos he is the captain of the tampa bay lightning my hockey team mm. um so we do a lot of crushing over here. I love that. I feel like we could literally just have a side podcast, which is just the crushes. Like, maybe we just bring it back. Maybe it's just us. Because, like, yeah, I, mean, I have some, too, that I haven't so discussed. I, I, have, too. I have a great deal. That we haven't even touched upon the Ben Affleck of it all. Like, we don't have time, but I've got I, things to say. Can I have, like, one one moment that I've recently, which is that I have, have, this, have you seen the Tom Holland lip sync for, of Umbrella? <laughs> Okay, so the thing about the Tom Holland lip sync from Umbrella is this is where I learned how many people did not know that he had played Billy Elliot on stage. Because oh, most people are like, they're like, I do that. they're like, how could he dance? And I was like, it used to be his job. So like, yes, I've seen it. I love it. And like, I just. But he perfect. didn't just dance. He didn't no. just musical dance like Billy Elliot. Right. Right, I mean, right, 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 right. Rachel, well, I don't know if you if you come more recently to this amazingness that is that clip. So it's like a it's sort of like an internet meme now, where it's basically like anytime it shows up, people are like, "Well, whenever it shows up, you have to repost it because it's mm -hmm. just." <laughs> so. And you know how I found out about it is through Lila's Twitter, who's someone that we're going to be yeah. podcasting with in future. Who I was researching and I was like looking at her Twitter, and it was like, "If you know, you know." And I was like, "I don't know," but and now you do. <laughs> yes. Whole crew. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was a big, big moment. And it's funny to me that he's like, I don't understand but why it's such a big deal. And I'm like, yes, you do. Come on. Yes, you do. Can you move your body like that, sir? <laughs> and you were like, you know, smacking the water and like, come on. I mean. I'm like, you knew exactly. <laughs> and there have been so many great 
lip sync battle moments, but that was just that another was level. That was literally the and best. The thing is, if you watch the whole episode, Zendaya does it before him, and she does mm-hmm. it before him, and she actually, yep. like, kills it. And in any other lip sync battle, she would have won hands down. So yeah. one of my favorite pieces in, like, his clip is the moment where you can see on her face where she's just like, she's like oh, like, damn, I lost. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, like... Yeah, if any other instance, like, prior Dancing with the Stars winner, I believe, Zendaya, like, if she was up against anybody else, yeah, and then just, and especially, like, once the rain hits, you're like, that's it, no. man. Valiant effort, but you have been outperformed. Yeah, yeah. Nice try with the singing in the rain business. Oh, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. this is what's happening. Well, we need well, to do we could... a podcast episode just on explain all this further i would fully come back for that (laughs) i love this let's make it happen i love this we 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 have like just a few minutes left (laughs) this is rude so far afield but i have loved the journey with you both i really have (laughs) i'm like should we just skip to the fun questions at this point (laughs) i I feel like i think let's skip to some fun questions that's all right yeah um do you want to go go for it (laughs) no you go you do it you do it you start well, I think we may have asked you this when you came for our live event back in whenever that was, March, June, who knows what time is, but what do you, I think it was what April. do you like to geek out about that's not related to something that we've already talked about? Hmm. Very, I'm a bookish person, so anytime someone's like, what are you reading? I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I lo- like love, and it's funny because I watch a lot of TV and I, I feel like I also then have to clarify, like, I also read books. I feel like we're past that as a society where we're not judging people for not reading, but I do read. Um, and yeah, I do. I really, I love TV. I love animation in particular, like love cartoons. Um, so I will talk to people about color- cartoons all the time. What are you watching for the animation right now? There's a lot of good stuff. So I just finished this morning uh, the newest season of Star Trek Lower Decks, which is their like adult animated Star Trek. Love. It's so good like you can kind of know the star trek lore and still enjoy it um i'm like i know enough about star trek to enjoy it um and it's it's great uh futurama is an all-time favorite i'm always at some stage of re-watching or watching bob's burgers um archer just finished and i'm very sad to see it go uh yeah there's the boondocks is a great one um and i know they've toyed with bringing that one back a second time i'm ready whenever they get there but yeah, love, 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 love cartoons. We live in a golden age. We do. Um, actually, last thing on crushes, I promise. Um, I was at a show over the weekend where somehow we got into like cartoon crushes because one of the comedians on the show had mentioned having a crush on adult Simba from The Lion King. So then the host came back up and said that he as a kid had had a crush on Robin Hood from the animated Robin Hood, which... That was Genu- my- genuinely who did it so yeah so i went up after he went up and said if you have had a crush on robin hood animated fox which again everybody did um there's a movie that came out and it's based on a series of kids books called the bad guys and they're mr wolf <laughs> plus just taking notes like I'm yeah, Mr. Turn this down because I'm like obviously I need this in my life ASAP. Do I need to go in my my calls after this podcast? No, I'm going to cancel it and watch all these things. Please yeah, don't. M- Mr. Wolf from the Bad Guys, and I, I think it's on Netflix now. But just hot cartoon animal. We haven't touched that level in a while. Uh, voiced by <laughs> Sam Rockwell, who it does uh, not hurt. Yeah, so it'll be part of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like. It's- go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, I feel like we have the several new names for the title of this podcast episode. So, <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm options. Um, but what are you reading right now? So, I just finished Anne of Avonlea, which is the second Anne of Green Gables book. Um, I had not mm. previously read the Anne of Green Gables books, which, having been born in Canada, felt blasphemous. So, I was like, this is the year we fixed that. Um, <laughs> and I'm getting ready to read a book called, like, it's on my Kindle, and I'm going to start it today when I have to get on the train. Um, it's called Freaks, Gleeks, and Dawson's Creek. And it's about seven shows that change the face of, like, teenagers on television. So... Okay. Freaks and Geeks is there, Glee is there, Dawson's Creek, of course, Friday Night Lights. Um, so I'm very excited to read that. Um, wow, that and then there's great. another book 
called Burn It Down by Maureen Ryan about like power differentials in Hollywood. So it goes a little bit into the Weinstein scandal and things that have happened based on race. And I am prepared to be furious the whole time through, but Mo has done wonderful reporting on it, probably going back like five or six years. So I'm excited to see like the book, like the feature length of that reporting kind of come uh, into into fruition from a writing perspective. Ooh, these are so good. These are so good. Pining as we get at least, I know Rachel lives in paradise, but here <laughs> in Western Massachusetts yesterday, it snowed. It literally <laughs> snowed. So I'm like, I'm ready to like conquer down. So this is perfect. I'm yes. Yeah, Curl up with a book and some good TV and some swoon worthy cartoons. Like, man, what do you need till spring? Nothing else. <laughs> All right. One, I want to give our listeners some practical advice. Great. So what's the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you if you want to share? So I think for a long time, just between kind of being first generation North American and being socialized as a woman and just like being very anxious, there was a lot of like needing things to be put in the right spot. And I kind of attacked everything where it's like, you try it once and you should be perfect at it if possible. Um, and a lot of things that were just like really regimented and didn't really have a whole lot of space for creativity, frankly. And I think that it is an achievement in some ways to kind of got into a space where I appreciate creativity and spontaneity so much because I was not built that way. And it is still difficult to do sometimes. Um, and then even going into comedy, the first couple of years, it was kind of more of a process than an experience. Um, mm -hmm. And then I read this book from a comedian that actually has roots in Boston named Josh Gondelman. And the book is called mm -hmm. Nice Try. He is among the nicest humans you will ever meet. Um, he used to write for Last Week with John Oliver, wrote for Jesus mm -hmm. and Marrow, but started stand up in Boston. Mm -hmm. And there's a chapter in his book where he talks about having come up in comedy and Mike Kaplan, another comedian, always telling him rather than break a leg or good luck before his sets, have fun. Oh. And that changed a lot of things for me, not just in comedy, but in general, because I think like we're not here for a long time. We hope to be here for a good time and like enjoy what it is that you're doing. And like if you're doing things that maybe you need to do that you don't enjoy, find space to find things that you can enjoy in them or find ways to have fun outside of it. Um, and it changed the way that certainly I think about comedy, but also about who I choose to work with, what I choose to work on, um, being able to find space for that. Um, it is change the way I am as a person to, to get that reminder in the moment that I got it. Oof, mic drop. I feel like that's such a beautiful place to end it. That was gorgeous. And I so agree with you. And I think the one gift that this wild pandemic has given us is perspective on how short time is. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is such a great message. Have fun. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm a so appreciate your time. This has been so fun, a little bit silly, occasionally insightful. I, gosh, <laughs> this has been great. All around. This is what we aim for. You just gave your, your own podcast interview the review. I mean, I agree. <laughs> I would say more than occasionally, a lot insightful. But yes, we'll have to have you back and talk more about crushes because I'm like, I got so much to say and I want to hear all of yours. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. But <laughs> right. genuinely anytime you want. It's, it's Absolutely. very well. We if, if people want to find out more, learn more about you, all the stuff that we talked about, where it's the best place for people to check you out. So my website has all the things, amamarfo.com. It's got writing. It's got my portfolio for content design and UX uh, writing. It's got info on my comedy. Um, I'm also on Instagram and YouTube. Those tend to be the more silly places. And then I'm on LinkedIn, so you can come find me, follow me there. Um, but yeah, all all parts of me are represented across those platforms. Love it. Yay. Well, thank you so much, Ama. My pleasure. Thank you. Woo, we got to do that again. Okay. We were very silly before, during, after, but if you want to hit rewind, we would totally understand. It was a great conversation. You can find Ama and all of her incredible work in the show notes and maybe stay tuned for another spinoff podcast. I don't know, but all I can tell you is I was doing a lot of research this past weekend, listening to past episodes of Thirst Aid. And as I showed you all briefly in the intro i've been taking copious notes on celebrity crushes so i'm here for it we'll see i mean maybe we do the like a poll maybe we'll <laughs> set up like a little poll and then you can like we can get people to say if they want us to like 
bring back Thursday, but with us mm. and Ama <laughs> and other surprise guests. I see you, Jason Monsukas. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we keep speaking it into the universe. It's gonna happen someday, right? <laughs> it's like the secret. It's good stuff. Well, thank you so much for listening. Please don't forget to rate, share, and subscribe. It makes a huge difference in the reach of this podcast and by extension, this work. And please don't forget to visit us on YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn to stay up to all, um, sorry, to stay up to date on all the things SGO and more and and maybe crushes and all of it. (laughs) Bye. Bye.